Cool. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Che. I'm excited to be here at the Utah Data Meetup with a bunch of uh, uh, new faces, a couple of familiar ones. Shout out to uh, Emily, Josh here. It's good to see you both. Um, so I'm excited to talk about experimentation today. Um, a lot of this comes out of my own personal biography. So I was a very a very early data scientist at Airbnb. Um, I was the fourth data scientist joined in 2012. And uh, so it kind of predated all of the infrastructure, right? But back when I joined Airbnb, we were, all of our analytics was run off replica MySQL databases. It was orchestrated through cron for the things that were orchestrated. And, you know, we basically weren't doing that many things. And, you know, fast forward to today, I would say Airbnb is like one of the most sophisticated data shops out there. And it was just really fascinating journey to see all the, incre all the incremental steps. Um, in particular, um, Airbnb was a unique place that was founded by designers. And when you're founded by designers who don't obviously reach for metrics and data and empiricism, like you have this kind of unique situation where you not only have to like build out the infrastructure, you also have to win this culture war. You have to like get data a seat at the table. And what always struck me about that journey was that the way we did it was experimentation. Experimentation is this really fascinating topic that is a wedge into corporate culture. It fundamentally changes the way you do work, creating this uh, structure to take risks, to try stuff out. Um, and also just blended so well with Airbnb's culture of entrepreneurialism. Because once you run experiments, you have the ability to seamlessly run experiments suddenly everyone can try out their ideas. You don't have to win a political battle to say, hey, I think you know, I'd like something here. And, you know, I think for most of the people in this audience who have been part of experimentation cultures, you quickly realize like the things that move metrics a lot can be very unintuitive and come from anyone's ideas. So since then, I was the, I was the first second data scientist at uh, more recent companies, most recently at Webflow. Um, and again, just kept building experimentation programs. Um, it was kind of interesting because all around us, the rest of the data ecosystem has gotten so much better. You know, but back when I was running things, we had to, you know, run stuff off Hive clusters, which open source tools, and you know, we literally had to invent Airflow to do those that work. Um, but now, you know, you can get all the stuff off the shelf, but you still today cannot buy great experimentation tooling. Um, which is what led me to start this company. So, but this, this talk will, you know, be much more around uh, the actual technology of experimentation. And the, what we see today is that there's actually a kind of common experimentation stack that you'll see across everywhere. And people are kind of patching together different components to have it, uh, but everyone has the basic same pieces. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. A bit about me, I already mentioned it. You know, I was early at Airbnb um, and worked at a bunch of other places. Kind of my head of data engineering has a very complementary background coming from the database world of Snowflake, Teradata, those sort of things. A bit of, of a kind of history backstory. So I mentioned before, you know, we, we, when we were at Airbnb, we ran a lot of experiments, but to do that, we had to bootstrap all this open source infra. Uh, we had a big hive cluster before that we had a big cluster had to build airflow and nowadays we have this modern data stack you know we got these cloud data warehouses and transformation layers i kind of define the modern data stack as that combination and what we're seeing is that suddenly series a companies can run experiments you don't have to be nearly as sophisticated or large to do this uh, I was most recently at Webflow, which was Series A at the time. We had three data scientists at the time, and we were running a decent clip of experiments. And the reason you do it, it's pretty clear to anyone who has run experiments before, is that until you start measuring, you're, you're shipping all these things, you're celebrating every time. But once you start measuring every product that goes out, you quickly realize that only a fraction of them are actually successful. Um, usually around a third or even less is a typical success rate. And that rate has been corroborated by these papers coming out of Netflix, Google, Airbnb, Microsoft, Yahoo, basically everywhere you look, you really quickly realize that only a fraction of products are actually successful. Um, of course, a bunch of them are also not successful and it's really good to not introduce degradations to the UX. So once you start to realize this mix of success rates, 
it's pretty crucial that you know what third is happening at a given moment in time. The companies that uh, realize this, they start building these end-to-end -end experimentation systems. So I was at Airbnb, the thing we built is on the top right. Um, other companies have a bunch of others. And under the hood, all of these uh, experiments, look, all these experiment infrastructure looks the same. Um, they all have some way to do randomization. They have some way to govern metrics. You pull these together to calculate a bunch of sums and aggregations, which you then plug into different things, you know, for overall results, your stat tests, your diagnostics, and these investigations. And then that you have to present all this in reporting. And I, I think among data communities, the, the importance of reporting can sometimes go kind of unheralded, where like the the whole point is to drive decision making. And if people don't understand why you're doing things or have confidence or context, then it's hard to have that influence. So it, you know, it's funny, in, in most of these talks, I usually go from here and I start stay at this high level, but we're, we're going to get into it today. We're actually going to dive into every single one of these components and talk about them because experimentation is this interesting thing where it's not that at its core, it's one deep, tough problem like query optimization or something like that. It's a big pile of medium-sized problems that all have to work in concert. And when you don't have a piece working, it can really set you back. So what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna dive into every one of these components and get my take on how to do it well. So, you know, if, if you do all this, then, you know, you can have a scalable, successful experiment system. Starting with, let's get into randomization and assignments. This is what most people think of when they think of a uh, kind of experimentation. This is kind of how most modern experiment stacks work is you have some server that will have details on all the experiments that are ongoing. And then you have these clients and these clients are, you know, there's a long tail of them. You know, they're like your Android services, iOS, you know, maybe has some JavaScript services, Python, whatever. All of them will have one function that fetches all the ongoing experiments going on. All those things are kind of small little JSON blocks, whatever structure you're gonna do. And then another function that says, given the ongoing experiments, what is this user in? And the specific thing to know about this is that there are, I think, three problems to solve. One is how do you serve experiments quickly? Um, you load a home page and you want to not have it flicker between different uh, treatment groups. You want it to kind of actually immediately emerge as what you're doing. Um, and then especially on low connectivity devices like phones, you, you need to handle that. So what you typically see is the modern standard is that you want to serve these experiments on off CDNs. Uh, they have some kind of open source CDNs that let you do that. You know, the size of this experiment data, it's not so large. Um, and so you'll serve that out and then you'll want to block rendering until you get to this kind of get variant function. The other, this, so that's problem number one is how do you serve experiments fast? Problem number two is how do you randomize properly? Um, and the pretty much the answer you see at every mature company is to use MD5 hashing into buckets. Um, MD5 hashing basically just takes a string and it kind of puts it on these kind of like uh, even distribution that you can then put into let's say hundred buckets and then you'll kind of randomly sample those for the experiment. So that's problem number two is how do you randomize users given an experiment and then problem number three is how do you instrument what you did, you know, which is it under, it, it's really just a basic logging problem um, where you say like, I fetched this assignment and now I want to put it into my, you know, Kafka queue or whatever other logging infrastructure you have, like segments, whatever, and say this person was in this, um, this experiment. So this is the kind of, and it's funny, kind of you look at, there, there's a bunch of commercial feature flagging tools out there you know, like launch Darkly being, you know, classical case. Um, you, this is pretty much what they do. Um, you know, you have this sort of server serving experiments, then you have some MD5 randomizing and then you log it. So this is the first problem to solve. The thing I want to highlight here on this MD5 hashing thing is that a lot of people will get started with various other ways of doing randomization. The most common one is to use the last digit of a user ID or something like that. Um, 
that's how we got started at Webflow and a couple other places. The problem I always see here is that when you randomize by last digit or last two digits, um, what can often happen is a, a company will just always use digits zero through four as the treatment and five through nine as control or something like that. And it leads to this chronic case of guinea pigs where like, you know, if your user ID ends in zero through four, you get to be in every experiment ever. Um, and then that ends up being this kind of correlated experiment group. Uh, the other thing is that you want to be able to, you know, with MD5, like the alternative would also be say like doing a random function or something, like, you know, in prod, like just literally call rand int or whatever. But for most experimentation systems, you want to be able to replicate the randomization offline, you know, to make it idempotent, you know, however you plug in this user in whatever environment, you're always going to get kind of the same assignment. So that's where kind of MD5 hashes really come through because, you know, all you do is you plug in the user's info in the kind of experiment and you can, you know, it doesn't really matter where you are, you're, you're going to end up in the same place. So that's the uh, problem number one. Um, that, you know, we got a bunch of these problems to go through. So we're going to kind of speed through them and then talk about why, you know, they all need to work. So the second problem to get through is metrics. Um, this is something data teams, you know, we care a lot about this. Um, I, I think pretty much 80% of a data team's work is to define and serve high quality metrics to different places. The thing with experimentation is that you really want to define metrics by their underlying facts. Um, as a quick kind of show of hands, or at least zoom hands, like who knows what I mean when I say facts, a facts table. Yeah, I realize I can't actually see hands with the full screen, but I'm gonna assume, let's say half of you said that. Like a, uh, a facts table, is something where you're modeling atomic actions that happen at a specific moment in time. So at this exact moment in time, Fred from Acme Co decided to upgrade their plant. At this moment in time, Amy from Toyota purchased something and you know had $200 of revenue or whatever. But the main thing is just this moment in time because for experimentation, you wanna know, did this purchase or this upgrade, did it happen after or before the user was in the experiment. Um, this is good. This is really important for precision, and precision is a you know important concept in general with experimentation. It also will allow you to do kind of more advanced stats that we'll get into later. So this is kind of a core concept that can often break the way a lot of uh, other data warehouse modeling works. You know, a typical thing would be you have like an MRR table or something that's you know has one value per month or something. And so if you want to see, did you increase MRR or not? And someone got the experiment mid-month, it kind of puts you in a bit of a bind. You know, there are ways to hack around it, but the basic gist of metrics is you want to have facts. Um, so you can know if it happened before or after experiment assignment. The other thing I really call out, and this is a, a place of deep passion for me, because I think when you go from the world of an Airbnb or a Netflix or something with great tooling, and then you experience the rest of the world, one of the things you don't realize is how most tooling pushes you to use what I call shallow metrics, things like put conversions or whatever, where like, you know, you can know that a thing increased, but it's not really going to build a coalition. It's not really going to, you know, get the CFO to like invest more in experimentation. What you really want are business metrics, things that like kind of everyone understands why they're important, things like revenue, uh, activation, purchases, whatever. And the thing with, as you know, I'm guessing we have a, a mixture of business models in here. Like a lot of these metrics are coming from various sources and naturally have a home in data warehouses. You know, at Webflow, you know, we're a subscription business. We use Stripe to manage those, those uh, subscriptions. Stripe data ends up in Snowflake. And that's where we report off it. That's what we do. Um, so that's what we want to use. Uh, Another thing at Webflow, our metric was for activation was, did a customer's Webflow site get visited? And that as well was actions taken off the system. It was on customer's websites as opposed to Webflow, the app. So these sort of things you naturally need data warehouses and um, it's the type of metrics that will you know, move an org 
that like if someone boosted revenue, people would people would pay attention. And then I touched on it before. The other thing with metrics is that this is a place where you want to be, you want to use your highest quality data. So it's very, very common for even very successful experiments to have an effect size of let's say 5% or something like that, like one to 5%. And this gets kind of smaller as you go up in maturity. Like once you've gotten say even to like series B, you know, it's quite likely your experiment effects are somewhere around like two or 3%. And so when you're, there's a, there's a real garbage in garbage out element to experimentation where if you have some click event that is like 80% correct and you're trying to squeeze out of it like two to three percent precision, then you're, you're kind of in a rough place. So we saw this at, at Webflow that we had these because the the data that we want to use is Stripe, but we have tools like Amplitude that we're using click events. We instrumented this like upgrade event that was just off all the time. It was always missing ten percent upgrades, um, and so yeah, that was an ongoing issue. And Airbnb even. As late as 2017, you know, by that point we had metric layers and all sorts of sophisticated stuff. We still did not have a booking event that was accurate as accurate as the one pulling off the Rails table. So, and the reason this stuff can matter a lot is that uh, you really want, like, what can often happen is that some experiment will be perhaps broadly successful, but in a specific context will be really broken. Um, and if that specific context, say Android or something, uh, just has bad telemetry, then it would, might be invisible to your experimentation system. Cool. So yeah, I could go on, on metrics for a long time, um, but uh, I'll uh, quickly uh, yeah, that's that's exactly a good way of saying it, Josh. Like a, a big problem with dirty data is that dirty data is not evenly distributed. And quite likely it's distri it's unevenly distributed on places with that are more prone to experiment issues. Yeah, yeah, totally makes sense. Cool. The other thing I'll say about metrics is that it's really helpful to use again the core, the their actual North Stars, the stuff that matters. So this is something we saw all the time at Airbnb is we, you know, we ran so many experiments and they, I would say all of them had this one pattern. They would move, search the contact, like, and, and, I mean, take a step back. At Airbnb, you have these steps in the funnel. You first make an Airbnb search, then you uh, contact someone maybe and say like, hey, I have some questions about your listing. You might request to book it and then, uh, if they accept it, you have an actual Airbnb booking. This was this uh, picture was pulled back from 2013 when there wasn't as much instant book. The thing we saw at every on every experiment is that you run some experiment in one part of the funnel and flex down, and the other part moves up, and it nets out to something even. So when when you run these experiments on some upstream part of the funnel, then and you start celebrating or getting upset at different movements of it like it's quite likely the other parts of the funnel sort of compensated for it. So again, it's good to go to the bottom of the funnel with these metrics. So yeah, that was a deep dive on metrics. I, I think we could probably do a whole hour on metrics, uh, various businesses and how they compare across marketplaces, uh, SaaS businesses or whatever. Um, but I'll pause there and move on to the next topic, which is sufficient stats, sufficient statistics um, to help everyone understand what sufficient statistics are. They're basically these data aggregations where if you know them, you don't have to know anything about the raw data. A classic case is the mean. If you know the average of a distribution and you're only communicating to people in averages, then you no longer need the, the individual records. The thing about calculating sufficient statistics, this is the DAG of every single experimentation pipeline out there. You start off and you have these records of when people entered the experiment. You have those facts that I mentioned, and then you got to join them. Once you join them and you say, of all these different purchases, whatever, here are the ones that were in my experiment, then you just do a couple of group buys. That's basically it. You take all those facts, you group them to a subject level, and then you group them to an experiment level. 
Um, and the key thing to know about this DAG is that this initial join is where all the action is. This is a very computationally intensive piece. Um, at Airbnb, where, it's, where we, run, we run a lot of experiments, the experimentation pipeline essentially is 30 to 50% of all data computation. Like if you take everything that the data warehouse does, it's like around a third to a half of that is going to experimentation type computation. And when you look at that uh, DAG, it's really just this part. You know, the rest can kind of happen in like a DuckDB or whatever. Like, you know, it doesn't require like crazy things. Um, just this big join takes most of the computation. Yeah, let me go quickly field this question. Yeah, exactly. So it fits in terms of the idea is that the mean covers what you need from the base data. The thing is that the mean is not the only sufficient statistic. You also need things like standard deviation, you know, other statistical methods will want more than that. The point is that there's a, a common, there's like a set of numbers where if you have that set, you no longer need the previous ones. Cool. So yeah, this is a DAG, you know, it, it's covered, it, there's an Airbnb blog post out there that has it kind of more detail, but as data engineers, this is kind of the main thing to know about the metrics that you have to automate is that you basically have one big join at the top and then two group buys. And the main thing to be concerned about optimization wise is this big join. Cool. So getting into stat tests, this is one of those pieces that gets a lot of play in the discourse, a lot of passion. I know my man, uh, Josh here has a lot of, a lot of takes on this. Um, most companies, you look at them, they're like, oh yeah, just do a t-test. Like this is actually the state of the world for like 98% of it. And, and the people who kind of care a lot about statistical testing will, you know, are, are probably full of anger at that. Um, the thing about most off the shelf statistical tools is that they push a lot of expertise onto your team. Uh, if you're going to use these sort of methods, here's all the things that have to be true for you to actually get value out of an experimentation program. One thing is that, I guess even as a basic, let me, let me just kind of define what a t-test is. Like a t-test is the most commonly used statistical test that says like, you know, was group A uh, more successful than group B? It just incorporates the amount of noise that you're seeing and it just says, is one doing better than another? It's you know it's pretty old method. Uh, it, it's covered in most stats textbooks. I would get if I would guess if you took a single stats class in college or whatever, you, you probably did it. But the thing about t-tests is that it, it, they were kind of designed for like doing tests on mice and labs or whatever. Like you know it's not it's not really designed for what most will do in these applications. And specifically, what if you're going to do them? Here are things that have to be true. One is that you're not supposed to look at your results until it's done. You know, obviously looking at results doesn't actually matter, but when people look at results and they see things, they start making decisions and actions. And that's what you, you're not supposed to do because uh, early actions are likely mean that you're gonna increase your false positive rate a ton where you're suddenly you're just fitting random noise. The other thing you're supposed to do is not, often people wanna test three or four variations. They wanna look at, five to 10 metrics, doing that, you need to, yep, it has the p-hacking problem. There's p-hacking, all, all of this stuff is basically, you know, some, some amount of it, but like the first two, especially. Uh, the second part, uh, you're not supposed to look at that many things because uh, it runs into the same problem, multiple comparisons. I'll touch on that uh, right after this. Uh, T-tests also are, not very resilient to outliers and power laws. Um, I'm going to explain what power law is in a second, but a big thing is in the real world, outliers are very common. Um, I would guess most of your businesses have situations with really, really big outliers. Um, and then in terms of metric types, there's only a certain types of metrics you can really do, you know, proportions and sums. There are other, whereas a lot of people want to use things like ratios and other things. So all in all, it's just, there's a lot of rules you have to follow. You know, I'm not actually expecting everyone here to walk out of here knowing all the rules, but there's a lot of rules you have to follow. And these t-tests, they kind of push on your organization to know all them, which is not, you know, not very scalable. This is the multiple hypothesis problem. You know, XKCD, like always, they do it really well. Um, 
you have some team scientists they're going to test like every uh, jelly bean to see if there's a link between that and acne. The thing is, if you just run enough jelly beans through the process, then you're eventually going to get something. And you know, of course, it gets news. Um, and so this is the problem with the like if you're testing multiple variants, um, multiple metrics, is that some is going to show up. And so how do you be wary of that? Is you know, there's a whole class of statistical corrections to make to make sure you're not coming up with superfluous jelly bean acne connections all the time. This is how you correct for it. Um, there, the most common correction is a thing called the Bonferroni correction. It basically says like, oh, you think you need a p-value of 0.05 and you're running three different tests. Well, now you need uh, 0.05 divided by three, whatever that number is, uh, as to actually get a stat state result. And then there are more kind of complicated things. One's called the home Bonferroni. Um, it, it tries to be a little less conservative while still giving the, the, the guarantees you want. Um, again, this is something where like it, you, it's probably worth reading up on the paper of exactly how you do it. But by and large, I, I generally try to push people to, you know, be, just be conscious that testing more things, testing more metrics, like uh, it comes at a cost where you know, you're, you're more likely to get superfluous stuff. Yeah, uh, in terms of Bonferroni things, the automatic system funnel, yeah, this is actually kind of an interesting thing. The, uh, part of the issue with a slide like this is that I'm guessing all of your organizations want to look at a lot of metrics and a lot of tests, um, which is kind of against the grain of what statistics wants you to do. And so at EPO, we actually have a sort of nuanced take on this that like, what we, what we say is that there's a class of metrics that are gonna affect your decision. And we're gonna be very careful about those, do all of these corrections on the slide for them. And then otherwise we're just gonna put you in this kind of wild west uh, data playpen to make bar charts, make line charts or whatever, but we're not gonna give you the statistical tests to, to make you, to give that theater. So a bit of a digression there. If, if we get to some live mock-ups, I'll share more of what I mean. So the other thing about statistical tests is that there's actually a lot of meat on the bone to improve them in ways that I think are not really appreciated unless you've worked at a place like an Airbnb or a Netflix or Uber. So there's a whole class of problem called variance reduction. The idea is if you look at, if you're comparing two groups, um, it might look like this on the left. Um, where there's just a lot of dispersion variance that's like within the group, like the width of these two curves, that is much wider than the distance between them. And there's ways to essentially take that variance out of the analysis and kind of create little skinnier um, charts that have that are a little easier to discern. Specifically, there's a method called Cupid. Um, this is probably the most commonly used one. And what it basically does is say, it's, it's kind of a neat little trick. It basically says like, instead of predicting, instead of comparing revenue across two groups, let's compare uh, a prediction of revenue and then say like, you know, I can make guesses for how much revenue everyone's gonna get and those residuals I'm gonna use for my statistical test. So the way I explain it most often is with an analogy to say McDonald's, Suppose you're, you are McDonald's and you're running some experiment and you want to increase the number of Happy Meals at McDonald's. Uh, the, you could just count Happy Meals and see if one's greater than another and do a stat test. But you can actually do better than that by noticing that the second someone walks in the door, you can kind of know if they're gonna buy a Happy Meal. For example, this like single, you know, 40 something or whatever is probably not gonna buy a Happy Meal but the family that walks in with like three kids might buy a half a meal. And that type of knowledge where the second they enter the experiment, you kind of know a little bit about them, lets you run experiments much faster. So an experiment that might take two months might actually take like a month and a half or something. Um, and there's kind of various amounts of reduction you get, but this is a method that's been mainlined into, you know, every experimentation system at like Lyft, Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, Microsoft, whatever, but isn't really generally available uh, to the rest of the market. Any questions on Cupid? I know that this all gets a little bit 
kind of esoteric and weird with advanced stats. But uh, hey, this is a data engineering meetup and I got 45 minutes. So we're getting into all of it. Uh, I had just one quick question. So um, is Cupid mostly applied to like uh, frequentist methodologies? And, and if so, like would the equivalent from a Bayesian perspective be just like extremely strong priors? Uh, I think you can apply methods like this to Bayesian approaches as well. Okay. Like, it's funny. I, actually, I say Cupid, which is a very specific OLS centric method with frequentist methods mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But there's just a whole class of problems which have this same paradigm. You know a bunch of yeah. stuff about people coming in. You make you can make intelligent predictions about them, and then you can characterize the the distributions on the other end. But like so, uh, in some ways, I'm using Cupid as a shorthand for a broad class of tools that basically have the same shape. Gotcha. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So the thing to uh, I should also call out with Cupid is that like you know I mentioned there's various characteristics characteristics you can use to make guesses. Um, so, you know, you know, age, gender, time of day to enter the experiment, device they're on, there's all sorts of stuff. It's kind of like a machine learning problem. But the book, almost always the most important one is just have, in this case, like have they purchased a half meal before. It's just like, if you're measuring revenue, the best indicator of like whether someone's going to make Airbnb bookings in your experiment is did they just make an Airbnb booking 60 days before? Um, and so usually you'll, you'll see a lot of, tools that would run Cupid with just one regressor. And all it is is just, what was their metric value before in the 60 days prior? So yeah, here's a, here's a typical regression or whatever. So you say like, you know, I'm going to predict the amount of happy meals, whatever. I got a bunch of coefficients for various characteristics. The most important one is how many happy meals they do before. And then you end up with one last coefficient, which is, um, what treatment group are they in? And the uh, output of regression for that treatment group is uh, you can, that that's actually your stat test. Um, so that that's the, the typical approach. But as I was mentioning to Josh here, like there's a there's a kind of wider class of problems that all have a, a similar shape. All right. So then the p hacking thing, the early stopping. I mentioned before that uh, you're not supposed to look at your results until it's done. Um, and this is why that is the case. So this is just pulled from kind of an Airbnb blog post on the left. Like if you have, if you're running some experiment and you just track the p value according to a t-test over time, it, it's just very likely that it'll be significant for a, a small portion of time. Like this is a pretty typical thing. And so if you are doing early stopping, if the second it crosses this significant threshold, you stop the experiment. You're you're p hacking. You're you're going to just have a lot of noise that looks really good. Um, so what you're supposed to do is not look at your result until the very end, and then say, okay, this was not significant. Now there's a method called sequential testing, um, which was kind of pioneered at Optimizely, uh, but you know it's what we use at Epo, and you know you see it at a few places. Um, what it does is say that. Um, Instead of having some static boundary, you have a dynamic one. You say early on, you have to have like a really, really large effect size to trigger a statistical significance. And then over time, it gets easier and easier, and then it converges on the t-test thing. And what's great about this is you no longer have to worry about this problem at all. Like if you run the sequential analysis method, then if it turns statistically significant, you're done. You're good. And so, boom, by moving off t-test, you've already declared that like, you know, you don't have to like hold people's hand on on uh, p hacking. I, I, I say that with a, a, the smallest of asterisks, which is that like you still want to run it for like at least a week or something. You know, like there, there's like you don't want to over-index on the fact that Tuesday is a hot day if you're coming there. But like, you know, by and large, uh, you can embrace a much more freewheeling experimentation practice. So that's that test, sequential analysis, Cupid, a whole bunch of things. Did, that's now we're going to touch on to diagnostics. And diagnostics is where we move from the kind of academic circles of experimentation into the, the rubber hits the road moments of actually running this stuff in organizations a lot. Because diagnostics end up being a really big issue. Um, big enough that if you look at Ronnie Kohavi's book, for people who don't know, Ronnie Kohavi is, is, is probably the, the most 
kind of authoritative figure today around experimentation platforms. He wrote a book, he was from, X, he was from Microsoft, which was a very pioneering team in the space. The thing about his book is that the first word is trustworthy. You know, experimentation really, really sits on a foundation of trust. And if you're gonna have trustworthy experiments, you have to invest a lot of diagnostics. So the most common diagnostic issue is imbalanced groups. Uh, what will happen is you run some experiment, you think it's evenly balanced, let's say 50, 50%, but it actually isn't, maybe slightly, maybe it's 52%, maybe it's 48% split or something like that. Um, inevitably, whenever, in my experience, every single time there's been an imbalance issue, there's, it's actually been an underlying issue. Like there's actually been something wrong with the experiment. Uh, and the sort of reasons this would happen are one is latency. If there's for some reason, like a varying levels of latency by whether you're in the treatment or control group, then that like, if you're on some like phone in low connectivity area, you might not end up in the treatment group or something like that. And you end up in the control. So like, it, if you do things like not fire off your experiment event until like the photo loads or whatever, like these sort of issues can come up. So I think that's probably the most common issue I saw and it was pretty endemic at Airbnb, but other situations is when you just have bad implementation. So you add a condition for being in the experiment for treatment, but you don't add that condition for control. Um, that's another way you can end up with these imbalanced groups. And the most common way to detect it is to run something called a sample ratio mismatch test. All it does is say that like you expected 50-50, you saw 47%, 53%, and then you kind of sum up those differences and run them through a chi-square test. Um, there are versions of this that are sequential so that you can kind of do it every single day and kind of have good and not cry wolf on this stuff. Um, this is the most common diagnostic, which I, I think is actually table stakes for running an experimentation program. And funny story about this, you know, I mentioned to Joe at the beginning of this that I get the luxury of talking to a lot of different data teams. And there are some very prominent uh, Series C, Series D companies where the control group is always bigger than the treatment group every single time. And they are running a big growth practice off of this stuff. And you always have to be a little bit careful on, on how forward you want to be and, and, you know, tagging that. But this is, it's something that ends up being an endemic issue, you know, all the way, Airbnb today still runs into this. The other big diagnostic issue are outliers. I alluded to it before, but I, who here is a, read the seems led books or has heard of him or done anything i you know he, he's definitely a personality I, but the one thing i think is true of him is that he, he is correct that power laws are a lot more common than we think like when you think of social phenomena as opposed to the laws of physics it is quite quite likely that it's going to follow a power law anything that has any sort of network effect will likely follow a power law um so what is a power law a power law means that the extremes of the distribution are just a lot more common than you think. So look at this, uh, these distributions here, you know, the red is the normal distribution, which is the assumption of most uh, statistical tests. Um, and it, it kind of falls off really quickly uh, before at the extremes where these extremes are just not very likely. Power laws have what they call a fat tail, which means that these really extreme values are just a lot more common. And that's basically what you know, fat tails is another way of saying black swan events, where these sort of like mega outliers are just very, very common. And the thing about these outliers is that in an experimentation context, they kind of invisibly drive everything. So for example, at Airbnb, you know, most Airbnb hosts are kind of, they own like a, they own one, two, three Airbnb listings or something like that. But there are some Airbnb hosts who we used to call whale hosts who are, they, they're essentially property managers. They own thousands and thousands of these things. And if they are just unevenly distributed across treatment and control, just through the luck of the draw, they're actually gonna drive the entire experiment. Like, you know, whatever group they end up more on is going to win reliably. And I saw the same thing at Webflow 
when looking at say sites created, there are some people who create tens of thousands of sites because they're actually a corporation who creates Webflow sites. And so when you look at an experiment result, all you see is like P value this, you know, lift that, like it doesn't really show that outliers are driving the ship. Um, so this ends up being sort of a diagnostic issue. There are kind of two main, I would say that the most important thing is to just notice it's happening. Just even know that outliers are existing here because most experimentation tooling makes it pretty invisible. But there's kind of two main tools that I see to deal with it. Actually three, there's one more I'll list here. But one is Windsorization. The idea is whatever the 99th percentile of a distribution is, we're just gonna cap it. Everything above that is just gonna be the 99th percentile. Um, so that just means you kind of cut off that tail and just make it within like a typical distribution. Another one is Cupid. You know, I mentioned before that like the most predictive thing of how many Airbnb bookings you're going to do is how many Airbnb bookings did you just did you just do in the past 60 days. So that does a pretty good job of kind of bringing the outliers kind of back into the distribution because outliers in these contexts usually continue to be outliers. But the third, actually, that I really should have mentioned here is to use these things called non-parametric tests, which basically you compare the ranks of things instead of actual values. Um, I don't see them deployed at scale too often uh, because they you can tell that one group is greater than another, but you don't get like an explicit expression of 3% greater or whatever. Um, but that's another way you can make things robust to outliers. So yeah, th this is one of those things where like, I, I've just worked with so many companies and it's just so, so common to have outliers that it, it, it's always amazing to me that it's not a, you know, part of every platform. Okay, I have a question with yep. this. So I have in the past solved this sort of problem by doing some sort of bootstrapping where I'll like resample, uh, resample from my groups. So yeah. if I had you know group A and B and I'll just sample, I'll, I'll down, like sample some from group A and some from group B. Um, so like you, your errors go up because you have a smaller sample size, but you can then compare the statistics like of how stable it is, you know, given a, a hundred yeah. random people from this group. Yeah, 100%. So yeah, Dylan, we're definitely gonna be talking after this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm very curious what you're doing in your career. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> You know, there are experimentation platforms that actually embrace bootstrapping as the basis of all stat tests. And mm. you know, they no longer run these kind of closed formula stat tests. And they kind of just say, no matter what, we're going to be bootstrapping. The nice thing about bootstrapping, and I, I don't know how many people in the, in the crowd here are familiar with this, but it's this kind of like interesting method where you take your data set and then you just kind of resample it over and over and over. Um, and that lets you get a, a general sense of variability. Um, the nice thing about bootstrap methods is that it's this kind of like one hammer that turns everything into a name. I, I think I misused that expression. It's like, it's very, very widely applicable. Very, very widely applicable. And it handles a lot of underlying issues. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So I mentioned before, like, uh, so here's the EPO uh, um, dashboard of like how you might see things. One of the things we invested in, which I don't see in many other data tools, but it was actually a, a huge thorn in my side that got me to do it, is that when you're running these experimentation programs, you typically uh, are doing it on top of a data warehouse that's changing very quickly. You know, it, a lot of times you don't have an Airbnb scale data engineering team that's going to like make sure the data is always pristine at all times. And so when you look at these experiment results, you know, the sort of thing we do here is fairly typical. You just look at the lift and you have some amount of variability around it. But under the hood, it's very much garbage in, garbage out. Um, so, like, if I remember at both of Webflow and Airbnb, et cetera, whenever you run some experiment and it gives some result that you don't fully expect, you know, and PMs always think this stuff is going to be, they think every experiment is going to be a huge success. And of course, like I said, only a third of them are. Whenever things inevitably don't match expectations, the first scapegoat is data quality. It's always like, am I even looking at a data warehouse that's up to date, data tables that are updating, that are not missing days, that don't have a bunch of cleanliness to use? So, what we ended up doing at EPO was to say, we need to make these data quality issues a lot more visible. 
so that you don't have to ask the analyst, am I looking at good data? And so we created these little data quality scorecards that let you like, you can click on any metric, you can see how recently the data was updated, um, what table it's pulling from, hopefully it's pulling from some like canonical core data concept, and not like random ad hoc table. And then hopefully your metric doesn't look like this. It looks like something very stable that like matches your BI dashboards. So quick little product drop, but mainly just to highlight this diagnostic issue that like, you know, the game here is trust. People's careers are gonna be bent by whether their experiments succeed. And there's always gonna be this nagging question of, is the data warehouse in a good state uh, when I'm looking at my experiment result? So whether you use EPO or otherwise, just make sure you have some way, like some sort of like, you know, here's, is my data healthy uh, sort of check. Um, yeah, and interestingly enough, I'm, I'm kind of watching the, the bootstrapping debate. I spoke with someone from uh, Credit Karma recently, and, and they're pretty big. They are bootstrapping everything. They, they are they are doing a full-on awesome. everything bootstrap. So I thought that was yeah. cool. you know, I, I'm thinking about that. Uh, <laughs> no, it's super awesome. And like I, uh, so at like Chow Now, um, you know, the experiments we run, we're, you know, analyzing, you know, potentially for like a two-week experiment probably. You know, on one of our products, like a hundred, a thousand, hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand users, right, per variant. And like, I've implemented bootstrapping, but um, and I love it, and it's awesome. But it just like yeah. it, it gets real expensive real quickly if you're trying to do, you know, at least ten thousand bootstraps or so on that, like a hundred thousand sample. It's gonna get, it's gonna get rough. But uh, mode's still handling it, I guess. So uh, it's fine. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I wonder how long it'll last. Yeah. Well, at some point, yeah, I feel like you have to build your own systems to kind of process that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Then, like, I think it depends in part in like what, like what level you're bootstrapping, right? Like, because if you're, if you're doing, an, if you're like modeling something and then, and then trying to calculate an aggregate statistic on that, you know, if you have a lot, of, if you have a lot, it's basically it's how much computation do you have on your hundred thousand sample? Because hundred thousand is not not too bad, and if you if you have a way to parallelize, then then you could do that compute. You can cut down that computation pretty quick. Yeah, time wise. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, yeah, parallelization definitely helps for sure. Um, but like, so for example, at uh, Chat, I'm using. I'm using bootstrapping to mm -hmm. simulate the posterior distribution of like mm. a mean of something like AOV or like order value, right? Right. Um, yeah. And that gets that gets pretty expensive pretty fast, but it's like, um, yeah, a uh, good. It, it is a very good way to get to that posterior distribution without like assuming much about the underlying distribution, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really nice that way. Yeah. Cool. So anyway, diagnostics, make sure your data is really high quality. And then investigations. This is the other sort of rubber hits the road moment about uh, experimentation is that like the, the thing that I already mentioned before that experimentation, it's, it's pretty complex to pull off because of all these moving parts. It involves a lot of stakeholders. And then at the end of it, a lot of your experiments don't succeed. Um, the thing that organizations quickly figure out is that you need to understand what happened with those failed experiments. So there's this quote that Elena Varna said um, that really, really resonated with my experience having built these uh, programs from scratch a few times is that first you have to learn to test at all. Like you have to be able to run an experiment at all. And I've been on teams that had OKR for like a quarter, which is like run one experiment. Like that's it, it doesn't even matter if it's successful or not, just run one, because um, it pushes on all your infra to be in order. And like, again, there's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces here to get right. So that's a, that would be the first place to start, is just be able to run a test. And then the second step is learn to learn, where you need to understand like, okay, this experiment didn't work, but I learned something. Um, and there's different ways to make it make it so that you can learn. And only once you're able to consistently learn, then you can learn to win. So I think this is what part of every experimentation flywheel is first learn to test, then learn to learn, and then learn to win. Now, how do you actually learn to learn? Well, this is where a lot of these, there's kind of two sides to it. One is to actually 
craftier experiments with good hypotheses, uh, which is I, I'm not covered in this talk because this is a technical talk. But uh, the other way is to be able to investigate what happens when you had this promising thing, you were all excited about it, it was backed by research. Why didn't it succeed? What happened? This is a typical situation. So I, I have kind of two stories to highlight what I mean here. So at Airbnb, we would keep running these experiments that would look overall negative. But if you examined it, you realize that it's actually successful in the people, it, by and large, except for this big Internet Explorer bug that was going hidden. Um, and you know this is back in 2013, 2014, maybe Internet Explorer has improved their, their thing. But uh, at the time, it was just a really common thing. Um, Another thing with Airbnb would be we'd run these experiments. It, again, it would look negative, but if you look at it, it's positive everywhere except for East Asia. And the reason would be that we messed up time zones. And when you're doing last minute bookings, the time zone of the guest and the host matter a lot. And so there'd be like these sort of canary in the coal mine sort of situations with different user segmentations that would indicate an underlying like design issue. Your experiment just wasn't executed. Um, at Webflow, we ran into this issue all the time where, you know, I don't know who, who's all familiar with Webflow, but it's a way to build websites. It's sort of like a Photoshop meets Squarespace sort of thing. Um, as you can see here, the interface is, is sort of complicated. Um, you you kind of need to know a lot of CSS and HTML and stuff. Um, we kept finding with our experiments that there were these two user types that always wanted different things. It was one was a sort of business user, kind of solo entrepreneur or just kind of head of a business who's like, I want Squarespace, but with prettier sites. And then the other would be an actual designer who has made websites many times before on many systems. And whenever we'd run some experiment, these two people would just wanted really, really opposite things. And it was interesting to know because like it kind of leads to interesting directions. You know, maybe you need to personalize more, maybe you need to make a judgment on who matters more and understand their long-term retention characteristics or whatever. But the point is that without the ability to understand user segmentations, then uh, you, we wouldn't have been able to make a lot of progress in our experimentation program because we would have just butted our heads against these problems and failed good ideas. So the way you get there is it gets back to kind of like database modeling. Like what you want to do is have these concepts called dimensions um, dimensions are just like you have some entity concept, like a user is the most typical one, but it could also be an Airbnb listing or a Webflow site. In each one of them, you have a bunch of uh, segmentations they fall in. So, I, like if you have some user, you know, they, their gender, what marketing channel they came from. Um, and then you want to split all your experiments, not all, like you want to, when desired, you want to understand how the effects vary among these user segments. I'll also call out that for dimensions, not all dimensions are static forever. Um, some of them change, for example, a subscription tier, and you need a concept called slowly changing dimensions or type two dimension, dimension modeling, that's right, uh, to model them. Because it's actually, the, the purpose of experiments is actually to change some of these things. You know, Maybe the whole point is that you're gonna make, move them from free to paid. So you wanna know what was their user segment at the time of the assignment. So this sort of dimensional modeling ends up being a, a big deal for your ability to learn because these are kind of powerful investigat investigatory concepts for understanding experiments. When you use these dimensions, there's this one nice benefit. I mentioned before that the DAG of experiments looks like this, right? You have a big join at the top. It's the most computationally intensive part. Everything afterwards is a group by. Now, the vast majority of dimensions luckily can be incorporated later in the deck. It can be, once you're at this subject level, which is much smaller, then you can join on to these types of uh, dimensions um, and you know, cut your results by gender, by subscription tier, or whatever else it is. Now, there are certain types of things that I call dimensions that are a little bit further up in the DAG, um, like a product skew, like you want to split by product skew or something, but I'll, I'll avoid that tangent for now. By and large, most dimensions are further down the DAG and they can kind of be calculated on demand. You know, like you don't have to pre-calculate them. So on the left is, you know, in EPO, how you do these sort of splits. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, you have these multiple hypothesis correction problems when you start going down investigation 
directions. And that's why we actually don't give you stat tests on these things. We just kind of, we show you the, the lift across user segments and we show you the volume of the segments, but we're, we're trying to avoid the theater of p-values there. So this is really, again, really important thing. You want to understand the basic kind of like laws of physics of your, of your application. You understand when certain user personas like things and user personas don't or how it varies by region or whatever else it is. Um, if you don't do this, then you're just going to keep having a bunch of failed experiments and they're going to fail for reasons unrelated to the hypothesis, just purely around execution. So that's investigations. This last part is reporting. And I mentioned before, reporting is a really, really important thing. You know, you do all this machinery, you do all this work. At the end of it, you're hoping to actually change someone's mind on something. And the way you're going to do it is with reporting. The, this is, I think, probably one of the biggest gaps on the way I see most people do experimentation. So I literally just went online and searched for popular uh, experiment analysis templates in Jupyter and Looker and various things. And this is what I found. Um, you know, I think most, most of the industry is starting to realize that Jupyter notebooks are sort of an analysis tool, less a reporting tool. And, and that's fine. So I don't expect much of them. Must them. But when you're using things like Looker or whatever, I, I see a lot of teams build dashboards like this, where you just have so many numbers for people to absorb. And like, suppose you're like the, you know, some head of product or some marketing operations person, and you just, you just get dumped into the report. It's just very hard to make sense of things like that. Because you're just like, I, I don't know what number am I looking at? I look at significance and it just has a bunch of numbers here and there's SIG level, whatever. Like, you, you essentially need someone to translate. It looks like a bit like a Rosetta Stone view. Or even take something like over here on the right. You know, you have these segments um, and kind of some error bounds around it, but it's like, what, what, what should I think coming out of here? So I really think that if you're going to get reporting right on experimentation, you have to think about the audience that does not, under, does not understand the concepts of p-values or uh, data warehouses or uh, DAGs or anything as well. Yeah, exactly. Clearly green is, oh, green's my favorite color. So I, you know, I, I, it's always a winner to me. Uh, but you really want to think of like the junior PM who's fresh out of college and has never run an experiment before. So this is, you know, I mentioned before, this is a report card we made at EPO. And I, I, I think on the reporting side, this is much more of like my personal belief around organizations. But you notice we don't show a p-value anywhere because we just don't want people to have to try to teach it or explain it or whatever. Um, we have these progress bars on our app. And as the people who have run experiments know, their progress bar is a power analysis. It's like actually this kind of technical statistical thing you got to do. And so we just kind of present it as a progress bar because that's what people understand a progress bar. Um, and then similar deal when presenting results, we're like, here's a confidence interval. People understand confidence intervals. Like this thing is big and uncertain and this thing is certain. So. I think that, you know, experimentation, I, at the start of this talk, I talked about how the cool thing about it is that it touches on culture, it touches on the way a workplace operates and makes decisions. If you want to unlock that part of the practice, you need to think a lot around communication uh, transfer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I can totally see that, Joe. Yeah, the, the crappy charts are, are worse than tables and tables are worse than good charts. Um, you know, it's funny, even Airbnb today, a pretty sophisticated place, its experiment reports will just list out like 100 metrics and just require someone to make sense of it. Like there, there, there's no real guidance to it. Um, some of the opinions we made in FO is that like we, I mentioned before that we, we pick a small narrow set of metrics, what we call guardrails, the things that you always want to check and be sure of, and then your primary thing. We do stat tests on them, you know, multiple hypothesis corrections, that sort of stuff. And then all the other parts of like, you know, slice dice, funnel building, retention charts, cohort charts, whatever, that's all put in this explore tab, kind of duck that away. Um, though the dashboards, it's funny, our, our dashboards are actually powered by our customers' warehouses, by their own snowflakes or BigQueries or Redshifts. Um, yeah, I, I hear you on the 3D bar chart. We got to get some drop shadows or something. You know, it should like wriggle around and kind of. Yeah, I think it's maybe you. when you when you're ready to get your Series B. You know. Yeah, exactly. We'll bump it up. Introducing that. Yeah. <laughs> Once you're ready for the babies. 
So yeah, I would just say in general, like, I think data people just kind of show every number just because they're like, oh, someone wants it. Like be a bit opinionated, you know, just be like, here are the things that count. People appreciate opinions on reporting. Um, it lowers the cognitive load. So, and this is kind of the last piece, you know, this is obviously not part of any specific, particular technical thing, but I, I touched on this before that like, uh, there's a lot of infra to build. There's like experimentation tooling, it's, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of parts to get moving in sync. You can do some of them manually in like Jupyter notebooks or whatever, or kind of hacky code um, to get started. I think most companies that end up in a great place of experimentation, they start out with maybe something hacky and just re requiring experts. And then they, they try to turn this flywheel where you run one, one experiment and it's a trustworthy one because you just threw experts and statisticians at it. It gets people interested. Once people are interested, they want to invest in building out the infra more. Suddenly it gets a little bit easier to run A-B testing and more people are doing it. And they just want to turn this flywheel until suddenly the whole organization is really on board. Now, obviously, Evo, we think this file is a lot more painful than it needs to be. Um, it shouldn't require a whole bunch of political battles to invest in A-B testing infrastructure. It should just have a great A-B testing infrastructure and just deal with cultural problems, whatever. But it, you know, if you're not using us, I think you, you kind of focus on incremental cultural wins. So yeah, that, that's, that's it for the talk. We kind of went off the deep end here. You know, like I said, uh, there's a lot of pieces to cover. I threw the kitchen sink at everyone on uh, experimentation components. Uh, I definitely would love to open up for questions here if we have time. I don't know. Did I use all 45, 60 minutes, Joe? Of a... I, I would say uh, we, can, we can keep going. <laughs> so, cool, cool. Yeah. All right, well, that, that's all I got here. So open up for questions. Um, and of course, I'm happy to chat around EPO, around outside of this talk. Um, yeah, so let's open it up. Uh, I, I joined a little late on here, so uh, apologies. I, I wanted to, to come for the full session, but I've actually uh, followed you for some time, just kind of from your, your posts on LinkedIn and everything. Um, worked with the Airbnb team a little bit uh, just by means of being at the Druid company. I'm curious, do you see uh, this use case fitting well with kind of a, a streaming based architecture and kind of more real time decisioning? Yeah, the, um, yeah, it's a missing call out because I think in the end you really want to move towards something real timey. I think at Epo, you know, we are really focused on the kind of data warehouse batch use case for now, but and, and that's kind of coming out of a conscious decision that like the real time use case is, is, is usually around making sure your app doesn't crash or whatever. It's just yeah. like you know, making sure you don't put out like really horrendous stuff. And there, there happens to be a decent toolkit for that from things like Datadog and stuff like that. You can usually kind of get some amount of confidence, but you know, as a practice, you should aim to get things real time. And Airbnb today, it's experimentation pipelines are real time. Like everything I just mentioned happens in real time. I think that yeah. there's kind of an interesting story to watch. You know, there's this whole streaming SQL world that's coming out. Like the world of streaming is steadily getting a lot easier. I think the basic gist of um, what is the last thing I had on the pipelines? Uh, this DAG is, is kind of remains the kind of the main way that calculation is going to happen is that you have assignment streaming in, you got metrics streaming in, you got to kind of understand when a, a, a fact is in an experiment and then you aggregate it in various ways. Um, but yeah, a lot of this can be made streaming, but to date, like you don't need the business metric readouts right away. Like I, I, most companies you want seven days anyway, but you do want to make sure your app is not crashing because of some new product change. Yeah, well, and, and that's where, like, from what you've presented on experimentation, I, I would not want to build this as a streaming service, partly because, um, right, right, so, so the idea of, like, what does real time mean, and, and when would you want to take action, and if you want real time down to, like, a minute, or, you know, even, like, immediate, trying to get down to, like, seconds, 
or milliseconds. And you want, it's because you want to take action on that same time thing. So like, yeah, your app breaks, you want to do something immediately. But like most of what you described with experimentation, you don't want people making minutely decisions. <laughs> these, these sort of product decisions, user-based decisions have a, the, the, the rate at which you're making decisions is yeah, weekly or monthly or quarterly. They're driving larger strategies. And so real time there is like, you need to be able to have the data when you need to make the decision, but you have some needed amount of duration that has to run in order to get the data. And it doesn't make sense to have a system that calculates information faster than that rate. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Like it's I, that, that's kind of a real time batch uh, like paradox a little bit. Is that like you, people want stuff quickly because they want to see their screen light up, but it can be actually bad for data for decision hygiene. Um, my my case for Epo in real time is. One is just want to make sure the experiment's set up properly for diagnostics. And then two, like you do need that uh, basic, you didn't crash the app check. And worlds that put people into multiple tools to do it are just like suboptimal. But the, the real time story, I would say there's a lot of stuff for us to build before we care very, very deeply about real time. Well, and you have that nice uh, graph too of the um, P value over time and how that um, can just kind of wander. <laughs> um almost seemingly randomly in some ways right so yeah. <laughs> you know if you're doing if you so you'd have to have some sort of a boundary on on the experiment um right right yeah, i mean if you're going to do the real time thing you definitely need something like a sequential or whatever yeah yeah, yeah for sure but i could see that moving there it seems like the world's moving that way so i'm sure we'll Mm -hmm. Five years from now, I'll be like, yeah, batch was really fun back in the day. I don't know anyone doing that anymore. I, I, my real use case for it is is to try, like that I can see, is not necessarily that you'd want this sort of stuff real time. Like there might, but but just like consolidating your processes, right? So you don't have this sort of Lambda architecture where you have bat, like one job that does it batch and one job that does it streaming. You want to just like have one processor for, for your data. And if it can serve both purposes, then that's, that's ideal. Yeah. I, I find that the real-time case is strongest when, you, when you're trying to use it in ways that are a little bit more transactional. Like, you know, if you have like a, I don't know, you're, you're tracking your shipment or whatever, right? You want to know where your shipment is or whatever. Like the stuff like that is uh, um, the, uh, I think those cases a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. So with your, uh, with, with your, with Epo, um, you said things live in, in other people's like warehouses. Yeah. So like most of the data, like processing is done on theirs as well. So like, Kind of bridging to what Holden is saying with, like, if I had a whole Druid uh, streaming architecture, would this just leverage that? Like, how does that work? Today, we only work with Snowflake, BigQuery, and Redshift, the big three. Um, so what we do is we, uh, you know, those are kind of relatively publicly addressable systems. Um, you create a little Epo user on there, and then we, we just do this entire DAG in there, like everything in here. Um, no Oracle in there? Uh, not yet. <laughs> yeah, Ter Teradata is coming next. I like next. you named big, the big three. I know, right? Like, yeah, Snowflake, I, I, yeah, BigQuery, and Redshift. Yeah. It's like, and left yeah, there's, no there's some sad Oracle whatever. people out in the world right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he's he's going to announce This is Utah. The, uh, it's the land of SQL Server. Yeah, SQL, SQL Server, Teradata, <laughs> Exadig, they're all probably coming yeah, along yeah, with yeah, the uh, yeah, 3D yeah. pie charts in the um, next version. Uh, there's a world of databases out there that I just put my head in the sand and forget about for now. <laughs> it's probably good. <laughs> yeah. All right, but you build on top of those three, those three uh, yeah. databases. So what, we, what we do is you configure in our system how to understand those databases, and then our system turns into a big dynamic SQL engine that like does SQL mat libs or whatever and runs this whole DAG. Um, mm. At the end of it, you end up with these final results, and then we just kind of serve them in charts. And at that point, our application is basically a cache. It just like mm. make the zippy or whatever. Oh, so all of your stuff is essential. It is written SQL esque, and then you rely on the the whatever uh, database engine to parse the SQL and and compute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
makes sense. Any other questions? I can stop recording and then you can ask the questions you're going to ask. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop recording. Uh, Jay, it's been uh, awesome having you um, here. I'll, I'll leave the floor for questions. Um, uh, and also next month, again, we have uh, um, Jordan Tagani and uh, Julie Price from Single Store um, speaking about the one database to rule them all. The other cool thing um, is um, uh, Jordan first engineer in BigQuery. So we kind of, um, I don't know why I have this background now. That's so weird. Um, hmm. It's from the apply conference I gave the other day, but I don't need that anymore. Okay, there we go. It's like, why do I have that? Um, so anyway, yeah, it's gonna be a good one to show up to that. That's um, I think the third Wednesday of the month. I don't know what the date is. So anyway, I'll stop recording here. Um, thanks, Trey. And uh, this will be uh, posted up on uh, YouTube as well. So awesome. Yeah, thanks.